here's a question. Where does dehumanization come from? Where does it come from? Where does it come from? Here's a good quote from George Orwell. George Orwell said, one of the most horrible features of war, one of the most horrible features of war is that all the hatred, all the lies, all the propaganda always comes from people who aren't fighting. Who aren't fighting. Yeah. Politicians, media people, right? And if we're so naturally violent, one thing we know from history is whenever a country gets rid of its draft, whether it's America or the Romans, the rich people don't want to fight anymore. Right. When the draft is gone, rich people, they would rather stay at home. So many people ask me as a soldier, how did I become interested in peace? As a young child, I had witnessed how war had traumatized my father. And growing up living with him was very frightening due to his violent behavior. So when I was very young, I began thinking about the problem of war and why war has to end. But then many people asked me, if I wanted war to end, why did I join the army? Well, I think I joined the army for the same reason many people join the army. Because in our society, we're taught that we need war to end war, and we need violence to stop violence. So think about Spider-Man, Superman, and Batman. How do they protect humanity and save the world? Violent. They beat people up, right? Superheroes to protect humanity and save the world they beat people up. In the action movies I saw as a child, the hero would kill the bad guy, save the world, kiss the girl, and all would be well. Yeah. So you're taught in our society that if you want to make the world more peaceful, you need to use violence as the method. So most soldiers join the military wanting peace. And I'll give you a couple examples. During World War II, when we were fighting the Nazis, and Japan attacked us in our own soil, recruitment into the military is very high. During the Vietnam War, when soldiers weren't sure why they were fighting, it was much more difficult to get people into the military. And if you ask, if you read a lot of accounts of Vietnam veterans, they say they were fighting to protect the man to their left and to their right, to protect their comrade, to bring their buddy home. But after September 11th, when we were attacked, an American politician said that we need to use military force to spread freedom and democracy around the globe. Again, recruitment went up. I mean, listen to President Obama or President Bush. We're promoting freedom and democracy, and we're liberating people, and we're helping the women of Afghanistan, and we're protecting the American people, and we're making the world a bright, peaceful place for all of humanity by fighting these evil threats. That gets people to join the military. The Navy's new motto is a global force for good. A global force for good. And the military recruits a lot of idealistic people based off this kind of information. So most soldiers want peace, but peace is the objective, not the means of arriving at that objective. So what happened in my life that caused me to see peace not just as the objective, but as the means of arriving at that objective? What was the transformational process that caused that to happen? Well, during my time at West Point in the Army, I learned several things that changed my life, and I'll share four of those things today. The first thing I learned that changed my life was West Point taught me that in the 21st century, the nature of war is drastically changing. And it's changing in a way that many people don't realize. So how is the nature of war drastically changing in the 21st century? West Point taught me that in the 21st century, war is all about winning hearts and minds. War is all about winning hearts and minds. That term became very popular during the Vietnam War. But what does that mean to win hearts and minds? What it means is that you can no longer kill your way to victory. So a thousand years ago, you kill enough people, you win the war. 500 years ago, you kill enough people, you win the war. But now you kill too many people and you lose. You kill civilians, for example. And now more people around the world want to fight you. So technology forces war to evolve. So after the rifle was invented, swords were no longer used. After the machine gun was invented, people no longer fought lined up in rows. After the tank was invented and mass produced, the trenches from World War I went away. So what new technological innovation has forced war to evolve more than the rifle or the machine gun or the tank? What new technological innovation has dramatically changed warfare? Drones. 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 That's a good answer. Keep in mind, drones, we have had planes and bombs for a while. But this... Directed energy. Directed energy. This is way bigger. This is bigger than the invention of the machine gun. This is paradigm shit. Computers. The book on killing the last chapter is all about violent video games and violent media and how damaging it is to children. And he also has a book called Stop Teaching Our Kids to Kill. Stop Teaching Our Kids to Kill. And he's a military person. Now, 
He's a military person who knows that the training violent video games use is very similar to military training. A lot of expertise on that. Now, computers, television, cameras. I'll be great if that would have happened a thousand years ago. Would anybody know about it? Now there's pictures of everything. You kill two Afghan civilians, there's a YouTube video. And people all over the world see it. It's all over the international news. Mass media has dramatically changed warfare. Mass media has dramatically changed warfare. And West Point taught me that in the 21st century, wars are fought on CNN, Fox News, Al Jazeera, and the internet as much as they're fought in the battlefield. And if you're seen as unjust, and images of your injustice are shown to people around the world, you will create new enemies around the world far faster than you can kill them. And if you do not win the hearts and minds of the people, you will strengthen their determination to fight you tenfold, a hundredfold, a thousandfold. So here's a question to illustrate how much war has changed and the impact of mass media. What is more dangerous to the American government? What is more dangerous to the American government? Ten thousand, what is more dangerous to the American government? 10,000 Taliban fighters or WikiLeaks? WikiLeaks. <laughs> WikiLeaks way more dangerous. Way more dangerous. It's information war now. You gotta keep information secret because it's very damaging if it gets into the wrong hands. For example, if it gets into the hands of the American public, you realize what their, what their politicians are doing with their tax dollars and with their young men and women. Now, I was watching 60 Minutes and a Marine colonel in Afghanistan said, if you kill a thousand Taliban and two civilians, it's a loss. Why did that Marine colonel in Afghanistan say, if you kill a thousand Taliban and two civilians, it's a loss? Why did he say that? You kill two civilians and you turn the population against you. You create many more people who want to kill you. I mean, that's common sense, right? What would happen if the Afghan or Chinese or Canadian army came to America and killed two American civilians? We would go berserk. What happened when we were attacked on September 11? People don't like it when you come to their country and kill their people. That's common sense, right? So that Marine colonel in Afghanistan said, if you kill a thousand Taliban and two civilians, it's a loss. In other words, if less than 1% of the casualties you inflict are civilians, you will lose. But here's the problem. From World War II until today, the majority of people killed in war are civilians. Right. In some conflicts, up to 90% of the people killed are civilians. Just, that's just the nature of war. The chaos of war, the confusion of war, the fog of war. The drones are trying not to kill civilians, and they're killing lots of civilians. Because technology is not always reliable, and you have human error, and you have intelligence error. You get a report that there's two Al-Qaeda in the house, and it's full of women and children. So human fallibility. No matter how hard you try not to kill civilians, you end up killing civilians. That's just the nature of war. So if you see why war is so obsolete, you're using a method of conflict resolution that kills more civilians than combatants. In an age of the information revolution, where everybody can see it. And you can't fully cover it up because of whistleblowers and people leaking documents. So, how do you win hearts and minds? How do you win hearts and minds? How do you win hearts and minds? Well, the first thing you have to do, the first thing you have to do is you have to admit the fact that people have hearts and minds. <laughs> so you can't dehumanize them, right? You've got to admit the fact that they have hearts and minds. And we have to look at the masters of winning hearts and minds. We have to look at the masters of winning hearts and minds. Like Martin Luther King Jr. and Gandhi and Susan B. Anthony and Frederick Douglass. Nelson Mandela. Look at how Nelson Mandela won the hearts and minds of many of his prison guards. Mm -hmm. How did he do that? These people are masters of winning hearts and minds. Yeah, appeal to their humanity. Exactly. And we'll talk about that. So Gandhi, one thing I realized at West Point and after in the Army, is that Gandhi was more tactically and strategically brilliant than any general I've ever studied. Amen. Gandhi was more tactically and strategically brilliant than Alexander the Great, Hannibal, or Napoleon. And think about it. Gandhi was able to defeat the most powerful empire on earth, the British Empire, without firing a single bullet. Even more impressive, Gandhi was able to transform his enemy into a friend. I think if Sun Tzu, who wrote The Art of War, would have been alive and able to witness Gandhi, he would have been in awe, because Gandhi thought tactically and strategically. Gandhi given a soldier in the army and served in the Bourne Zulu Wars. And Gandhi used militaristic language. 
Gandhi called his methods the most powerful weapon, and he called his supporters an army of peace. And Sun Tzu had a quote. Sun Tzu wrote The Art of War. He said, winning a hundred victories and a hundred battles is not the pinnacle of excellence. Defeating your opponent without bloodshed is the pinnacle of excellence. And think about what happened in Egypt or Tunisia. What's a more effective and efficient way to overthrow a dictator? What they did or what we're doing? It's a more efficient, tactical, strategic method for overthrowing dictators. Because the information revolution is here, and because we have new methods now. So the second thing I learned to change my life is the idea of waging peace. The second thing that changed my life is the idea of waging peace. What does that term mean, waging peace? What does that mean? It means a new tactic. New tactic. And the name is kind of the term kind of defines itself, right? Like it's a verb. Waging peace is action. It's action. But it's collective action. Collective it's action. Solidarity with, with, with other people you're willing to sacrifice with. There's different forms of waging peace. Howard Zinn said between war and apathy, there are a thousand possibilities. There's a thousand possibilities between bombing people and doing nothing. And those thousand possibilities are waging peace. So you have people who wait to be somewhat alone. Look at Thoreau, right? Look at Thoreau. Look at Mark Twain, right? Look at Socrates. Pretty much alone. He had people who listened to him, but pretty much alone. Then you have collective action, which is the most effective form of waiting peace. And what are examples of waiting peace in history? What are examples? Civil rights. Civil rights movement. What are other examples of waiting peace? Gandhi. Salt March, right? Women's Rights Movement, Susan B. Anthony, Alice Paul, right? The overthrow the right, overthrow the right. All examples of ways of peace throughout history, right? Now, let's talk about a couple of misconceptions. What did the Founding Fathers talk about? No taxation without representation. No taxation without representation. <coughs> what does that mean? Exactly. Great answer. Great answer. Basically, you can't tax me, you can't make me pay you unless you give me a vote or a say or a participation. You can't tax me or tell me what to do unless you allow me to participate in the political process. That's a valid, legitimate complaint, right? But up until the 1820s and 1830s, 50 years after the Revolutionary War, less than 10% of the American population could vote. Women couldn't vote. African Americans couldn't vote, Native Americans couldn't vote, white people couldn't vote unless they own land. So 200 years ago in America, women couldn't vote their own property. Did they fight a war to get that right? Did the non-landowners fight a war to get that right? Let's talk about slavery. How many European countries had a war to free the slaves? How many European countries had a war to free the slaves? Zero. And in America, it took the civil rights movement for African Americans to truly got their human rights. Was a war fought for child labor laws or workers' rights? So you see how there's a big gap in our understanding of history. We're not taught how we actually got most of our rights, which impacts how we approach the problems today. So, wage and peace has dramatically changed our lives for the better, and we can keep going in that positive direction. The third thing I learned to change my life, and this might sound surprising, is that many of the skills you need for wage and peace, many of the skills you need for wage and war, you also need for wage and peace. Exactly, discipline. That might sound counterintuitive, but think about all the things you need for waging war that you also need for waging peace. Whether you're waging war or waging peace, you need training, organization, planning, recruiting. What else do you need for waging war and waging peace? You need people, right? You need camaraderie. Discipline, stamina, determination, persistence, patience. What else? Organization. Food. Resources. Whether you're... You even need money. I work for a nonprofit. We need donations. And there's a quote I heard one time that said, you would not believe how much money it took to keep Gandhi poor. <laughs> Whether you're waging war or waging peace, you need to win hearts and minds. We were trying to win hearts and minds in Vietnam. Martin Luther King Jr. was trying to win hearts and minds in America. Whether you're waging war or waging peace, you need to think tactically and strategically. You need leadership, courage, discipline, selflessness, sacrifice, camaraderie, solidarity, teamwork, cooperation, 
But there are two crucial differences between waging war and waging peace. Two crucial differences. What's different about waging war and waging peace? What are the two big differences? The outcome. In terms of the, because the outcome. Don't dehumanize your enemy. Don't dehumanize your enemy. The first one is obvious, right? The first one is violence as the means. Right? When waging war, you're trying to transform a human being into a corpse. When waging peace, you're trying to transform a human being into a friend. That's a big difference. But peace as the outcome actually is a similarity. If you look at Sun Tzu, Sun Tzu believed that war was evil. Sun Tzu believed that war is evil. And the natural state of the world is harmony. And the purpose of waging war is to bring the world back to harmony as quickly as possible. So Sun Tzu encouraged using minimal force to try to end the conflict quickly and bring the world back to harmony. But one big difference is the use of violence. The other big difference is deception. I think Sun Tzu said it best when he said, all war is based on deception. Right. When you're near, you want your enemy to think you're far. When you're far, you want your enemy to think you're near. When you're about to attack, you want your enemy to think you're unable to attack. When you're unable to attack, you want your enemy to think you're about to attack. When you're active, you want your enemy to think you're inactive. When you're inactive, you want your enemy to think you're active. And waging peace, on the other hand, is based on the truth. It involves exposing the truth about women's equality, racial equality, oppression, injustice, slavery, war, right? Gandhi never had any secret plans. Gandhi never had a top secret file. When Gandhi would conduct a demonstration, he would tell everybody what he's going to do, when he's going to do it. Because Gandhi knew that peace requires trust and mutual understanding and improving people's understanding. And that you cannot transform an enemy into a friend by deceiving them, and the truth is much better at winning hearts and minds than deception. So it's truth-telling, letting people know, look, women deserve equal rights. Women are intellectually equal to men. African-American people are not subhuman. We're equal. We deserve equal treatment. We're human beings. Or war is not inevitable. War doesn't make us safe. The military-industrial complex is bankrupt in the economy. It's truth-telling. And you can't fear from that. Otherwise, you go into the methods of ways of war. So I consider myself pro-military and anti-war. And people have told me, that doesn't make any sense. But it's like being pro-fireman and anti-forest fire. For example, Martin Luther King Jr. was very anti-war. He was anti-Vietnam War and anti-all war. But did you know that one of the few television shows that Martin Luther King Jr. would let his children watch was a television show that glorified the military? A television show that he himself liked. If you've heard me say this before, please let people figure it out. A television show that portrays people in the military with exceptional noble qualities. Can any of you guess what that show was? Blatantly glorifies the military. A lot of people guess MASH. MASH, by the way, is the Dalai Lama's favorite television show. <laughs> MASH, by the way, is the Dalai Lama's favorite television show. But the show was Star Trek. Star Trek. Star Trek was a show about the military. They used military rank, military protocol, and Starfleet Academy is based in West Point, even having that same rank insignia, and Monica is West Point. But in the future, there's no war, poverty, or hunger on Earth. So the military's mission just changed from war to peace, disaster relief, humanitarian aid, and exploration. And that's already happened to some extent in the world today. For example, the New Zealand Army is no longer focused on waging war. The New Zealand Army performs missions of peace, humanitarian aid, disaster relief, and it protects girls from cultures. And think of what the U.S. Army could do if its mission changed from war to disaster relief. The U.S. Army is... <laughs> The U.S. Army is the only organization in the world that can deploy tens of thousands of physically fit, mentally tough, well-trained people to any spot on the globe in a matter of days. Imagine U.S. soldiers being used for earthquake relief, tsunami relief, natural disaster relief. And the U.S. military is already doing this. In 2009, the U.S. military performed 154 humanitarian aid missions in 61 countries. So what's the problem? If we're helping people, why are people so angry at us? What's the problem? We're also killing people. And we're occupying countries with military bases, and people don't like that. How would we feel if a foreign country put a military base in America? We would go reserve. Right? We would go reserve. Yeah, when they were putting missiles in Cuba, how would that? Right? So imagine if around the world the U.S. had this reputation. Imagine if around the world the U.S. had this reputation. A natural disaster happens, the Americans come, they help, they leave. Leaving part's very important. 
The Greek Navy part's very important. And if the purpose of the American military, if the purpose of the American military is to protect the American people, the best way to protect the American people in the 21st century is to help people around the world. Because if you help people and fight poverty and all these things, then people are less likely to want to fight you and attack you. Right? That's how you can better protect the American people. So when we talk about the military industrial complex, we can't just criticize it. We have to offer a better alternative. We have to offer a better alternative that makes what we're doing now seem obsolete. If you transform the military into a natural disaster relief organization, and you go after terrorism with police work, like we went after Timothy McVeigh and the Nazis who fled Europe, you could cut the military budget by 70 or 80 percent because most of the military budget is on high-tech weapons. You keep the people in the military employed. You better protect the American people by doing good things around the world. You don't need all these military bases, right? We become what we claim we're doing about supporting democracy and helping people around the world. And would soldiers like that? Would soldiers like that kind of mission? I think 98 percent of them would. Two percent might not. But here's a quote from General MacArthur. Here's a quote from General MacArthur. General MacArthur said, if you ever wonder whether soldiers would like that kind of mission, remember this quote from General MacArthur. General MacArthur said, the soldier above all other people prays for peace, for he must suffer and bear the deepest wounds and scars of war. The soldier above all other people prays for peace, for he must suffer and bear the deepest wounds and scars of war. So I met a guy from Pakistan last year after I gave a talk. And after I gave my talk, he came up to me and he said, there's something I never understood until after I heard your talk. He said, I always saw Americans as being the friendliest, most generous, hospitable, optimistic people in the world. But their government such, does such terrible things around the world. He said, I never understood this contradiction. How can the American people be so generous and so hospitable and so optimistic and so idealistic? And how can their government support dictatorships and wage wars and overthrow democratic regimes? And he said, I finally figured it out. He said, I finally figured out the contradiction. I finally understand why the American people are so wonderful and their government is so terrible. He said, the American people don't know what their government's doing right now. They don't know what the government's doing. Right? Deception, right? Politicians being more self-serving than serving what's best for our country and for the planet. And the American dream and the American ideals. And America is a very generous country. We are a very generous country. But there's a saying around the world that America gives with one hand and takes with both hands. Whoa. So America gives with one, takes with both. The last thing I learned about that I'll talk about today is that war is not inevitable and that world peace is possible. General Omar Bradley, one of the last five-star generals, said, it is easy for us who are living to honor the sacrifice of those who are dead. Because it helps us to relieve the guilt, we should feel their presence. Wars can be prevented. This is surely as they're provoked. And therefore, we who fail to prevent wars share in the of the dead. So General Omar Bradley said, wars can be prevented, just as surely as they're provoked. And therefore, we who fail to prevent wars share in the of the dead. There's so much we can do to prevent wars and make a difference. And look at what has happened because people did something and made a difference. 200 years ago in America, anyone who was not a white male landowner was oppressed. If you were African American, Asian, Hispanic, female, even if you were white, but you did not own land, you were oppressed. Right. Right. 200 years ago in America, women couldn't vote their own property. But look at how far we've come because of the women's rights, civil rights, and workers' rights movements. I'm half Korean, a quarter white, and a quarter black, and I grew up in Alabama. And the fact that I'm here shows you how far our country has come. And if you look globally, 500 years ago, things such as democracy, the right to vote, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of the press, women's and civil rights, virtually did not exist anywhere on the planet. How many countries are democracies 500 years ago? Zero. How many countries are democracies 200 years ago? Keep in mind that Napoleon was a dictator in France, and Napoleon overthrew the democratic government. America was the only democracy. Iroquois Confederacy wasn't, they didn't have universal right to vote. What about England? They weren't a democracy. Okay. England was not a democracy back then. When the founding fathers complained about no taxation without representation, right. only about 10% of the people in England could vote. And the people in England said, look, you have as much participation as people in Great Britain. I don't see what you're complaining about. Okay. 
Because back then in England, most non-landowners could not vote. Right. And you didn't have these ideals of universal right to vote, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of the press. Those were very modern concepts, 18th century concepts. America was the only democracy in the 18th century. But America wasn't a democracy if you were African American. America wasn't a democracy if you were female. America wasn't a democracy if you were if you were if you didn't own land and you were white. But now we have democracies all over the world in less than 200 years. North America, South America, Australia, New Zealand, Europe, parts of Asia, parts of the Middle East, parts of Africa. In less than 200 years, dramatic change. Dramatic change. So the world has come a long way. The world has come a long way. And I can address something that somebody brought up, why people join the military. I'll tell you part of the reason I joined the military. My father was born in 1925. He grew up in the Great Depression. He was half white, half black. Grew up under segregation in the South. And ever since I was a child, my parents told me, the only place in America where a black man has a chance is in the Army. The only place you have a chance is in the Army. You have to go in the Army because we live in a racist country and you have no opportunity outside of the military. And that was my father's reality. They weren't, my parents weren't wrong, but things have changed. They weren't telling me untruth, they were telling me their truth, right? And when I told my mother I was getting out of the army two years ago, she was furious. I told my mother two years ago I was getting out of the army. And she was furious. She said, what do you think you're doing? She said, it's bad enough that you look black. She goes, it's bad enough that you're black, but you're also part Asian. No one's going to hire you in America. Keep in mind, the military desegregated prior to civil rights. So a lot of people, they have this, when people come from situations where they don't think they have any other options, the military becomes their only option. I didn't think I could do anything else other than be in the military. And that was my father's reality. That was the way he was raised. And that used to be the way many people felt, and some people still feel today. So I'm just saying we have to understand where people are coming from, right? Understand where they're coming from. Military gives young people four things they really need. Health care, college money, a job, and a pension. So we have to counter that and understand it first before we can counter it. And I gave this talk one time and somebody said, you're wasting your time because no matter how hard you try, you'll never convince everyone. I responded by saying, but I don't have to convince everyone. What percent of the American population actively participated in the women's rights movement? What percent of the American population actively participated in the women's rights movement? Less than one percent. Less than one percent actively participated. Hmm. Susan B. Anthony would give a talk about women's rights, and people would be screaming at her so loud she couldn't hear herself speak. And the people screaming at her were women. Very controversial issue. What percent of the American population actively participated in the civil rights movement? Less than one percent. Less than one percent actively did anything. And that's why Henry David Thoreau, Henry David Thoreau said, there are 999 patrons of virtue for every virtuous person. <laughs> In other words, for every person who, for every 999 people who think something's a good idea, one person does something about it. And that's a historical fact. So when you hear opinion polls, 70% of people think this or think that. Opinion without action has no impact. Mm -hmm. right? That doesn't mean that if we get 1% of Americans to struggle for peace, that we'll magically have world peace. Because that 1% needs to have a very effective strategy, a way to get the American public to understand. They have to be very disciplined and creative and courageous and highly trained. They have to be extremely effective. How do you get the Americans to comprehend and grasp this issue? You can't just preach to the choir. You have to go beyond preaching to the choir. And it's important we don't dehumanize people in the Middle East. I hear a lot of peace people and liberals say we can't dehumanize people in the Middle East, which is fine. <laughs> but I.
this, that, this one at the podium. The one at the podium. Yeah, it's almost done anyway. But you see how it's important that we don't dehumanize people in the Middle East. Very important. But I hear many peace activists and liberals dehumanize conservatives and people in the Tea Party. Oh, they're a bunch of morons. They're a bunch of idiots. Yes. They're a bunch of... They're a bunch of knuckle draggers, right? And anyone who's a Christian is an idiot. But think about the Tea Party. Think about people who sympathize with the Tea Party. Noam Chomsky said that the existence of the Tea Party is a real failure of peace activists and liberals to reach out to conservatives. Yeah. Mm -hmm. what, are they, what, are they, what are they angry about? They're angry about jobs. Mm -hmm. They're angry about the economy. They're angry about their declining wages. They're angry about the Wall Street bailout, which is what we're concerned about. Unaccountable government, government corruption, greedy politicians, greedy Wall Street bankers. These are the things these people are angry about, right? They're angry about many of the things that work, right? Wall Street greed, greedy politicians. And we have to show these people, look, we have to show these people, look, the reason the economy is collapsing isn't because of immigrants and teachers, it's because of the war system that bankrupts our economy. You can read General Eisenhower's Cross of Iron speech. And we can't dehumanize these people. We have to reach out to them, right? Remember, the conservative position used to be anti-war, not getting involved in foreign entanglements, low fiscal spending. But if people believe that war makes them safe, they will pay any price. And we have to show them war doesn't make them safe. And today it's even more important that we become part of that 1%. They can affect that change and shift the population. Today it's even more important that we become highly trained in the art of peace, waging peace and that we become part of that 1%. Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr. waged peace in order to ensure, in order to create a better world. But today, due to the dangers posed by nuclear weapons, war, and our destruction of the environment, if we don't wage peace, we won't have a world. Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr. waged peace in order to create a brighter future, but today, if we don't wage peace, we won't have a future. These things are survival issues now. And it's up to us to solve these problems. Now more than ever, the world needs us to wage peace. And I want to thank all of you for being part of the 1%, not the 2%. Thank you.